Good morning. It is great to be here with all of you this morning. And it's funny how life works out sometimes because I was going to open up with saying, well, have a look at everybody around you and just greet each other with a smile. Get that fellowship going. And well, we had a little bit of change of plans this morning. We took a little bit longer. So we've all had that moment to just embrace each other with a smile and just friendliness and love between us. This morning, I'm going to be talking about walking in shoes. Put up there is the last verse that Stephen read for us. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And that's an encouragement that I want to start all of us off with this morning. We need to make sure that we are those things, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, how are we always abounding in the work of the Lord? A couple of weeks ago, I did. Um, I led us with the Bible study, and although the focus wasn't supposed to be on prayer, it ended up being a lot on prayer and about steadfast prayer, and pray without ceasing. And I asked the question, well, how do we pray without ceasing if we still have our lives to attend to? We still have to drive, we still have to do these things, we still have to get the groceries. And really, I challenged your thought about what that meant in terms of pray without ceasing. And I want to get you to start thinking about not just now but during over the course of this week is what does it mean to always abound in the work of the Lord now I'm not one for New Year's resolutions and it just so happens that tonight has uh, taken us into 2024 but I am very much aware and I am a, a spokesperson of making sure that we do some goal setting and this past 10 days or so has been quite a profound 10 days uh, personally for me, just in terms of last week or the week before, Tom led us with uh, the study around trust and what that means. And for those of you that weren't present in that class, one of the closing statements was a very, very profound statement. And it's really got me thinking through these last 10 days. And the statement was this, and Miss Christine King is the person to ask if you really want to understand it, because she's the, the self-proclaimed expert, because she's read and written an article on it. But the saying was along this line. We know ourselves really well. So when we fall short of the goal that we've set for ourselves, we are less judgmental on ourselves. What do I mean by that? Well, if I'm five minutes late for work, I understand the reason for it, and I can justify, and I go, it's terrible that I'm five minutes late, but there's a good reason for it where the lady on the other side of the office, she might look at it and go, Richard, you should have gotten up five minutes earlier to get ready for work so that you could be here on time. She didn't understand the situation. She didn't know that I wasn't feeling well and that I actually wasn't going to go to work at all. But at the last minute, I changed my mind and said, well, if I don't go there, this is the consequences of it. So I'm going to put my big girl panties on and I'm going to go to work even if I'm five minutes late. And the whole thought process around that was the better we know the people that we are judging, the less judgmental we're going to be. How am I to know that if you walk in here five minutes late for Sunday morning service, that you didn't have a flat tire, that you didn't have somebody break into your car, that you weren't feeling ill and you made the effort to get you even if you were a few minutes late? Compared to if I know that you like to sleep in and Sunday mornings you've pushed that snooze button seven times and you're consistently late for church, I'm able to come to you and go, hey, you know what? We really need to work on this together. What can I do to help you? Do I need to come to you on a Sunday morning and have a cup of coffee with you at six o'clock in the morning so you can be here on time? Or do I need to rebuke you and say, well, you really need to pull up your socks? The only way we're able to do that is if we get to know each other. One of the other profound things that uh, has happened to me in the last, well, specifically in the last two days, was that Lindy and I celebrated our five-year wedding anniversary just two days ago. And we were sitting down, uh, we went away for a couple of nights just to go and get a little bit of alone time. And while we were sitting there, we were talking about how quickly these five years have gone. Half a decade. Blows my mind to think that just five years ago, we were standing 
out on a big field saying, I do. Reading our vows to one another and promising these things to each other. And if it's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned through this thing called marriage, is that we both have different roles to play within our marriage. Lindy is the organizer. If we're going away, she gets everything sorted. And I just need to make sure that whatever she's packed, I pack into the motor car and it goes with us on our journey. A couple of weeks ago, we went down to Florida. I was in charge of the packing because Lindy had to go to work. Well, I got down to Florida and realized I didn't even have a toothbrush. We each had those roles to play. And I just want to show you a couple of pictures here of some of the things that we've gone through in these five years. The first picture on the left is our wedding day. Second picture, we were in zip lining through trees. I am terrified of heights. I've got to spend some time with Mr. Chip. Mr. Chip says, climb up on that roof and help me with that. And I go, no, sir, I ain't getting up on that roof. But Lindy helped me through climbing up these trees 100 feet up into the air, attaching myself to a little rope, a little bit bigger than just a little rope, and sliding through those trees. We've walked with elephants. I was a lot more brave than Lindy in that circumstance. I put my hand into the elephant's mouth, much to the disgust of the guide who said, that elephant will take your hand off. Lindy stayed a little bit back, and for us to get this photo, I had to stand between the elephant and myself to protect Lindy. The last photo in the bottom right-hand corner is Lindy and I moving countries. In the five years of marriage, we have officially lived in four houses. That excludes the limbo stages when we were in. We've lived in two countries, and I made a joke on my social media saying, and we've had one credit score. I can't get a credit score in America because I don't have a social security number. The point is, is that we've all had our roles and responsibilities within our marriage. During our move, you know how it goes when your shoes are lying all around. Lindy took my shoes and put them on her feet because her hands were already full. She fumbled around getting my shoes to where they needed to be to pack up. Well, I tried to do the same with hers, and I ended up breaking her shoe because I couldn't quite get my foot into it. But the moral of that is, is that we all have our shoes to wear. We all have our responsibilities that we have in our marriage. Now, why am I telling you about my marriage? None of you were there. None of you got to witness it. I've shared some of my vows with some of the people here, and I've got big eyes staring back at me. Why? Because I'm from South Africa, and we say things a little bit differently. So if I say something here this morning that you're not quite sure of, please pull me aside afterwards and say, hey, what did you mean? Hey, that's not something we say here. Or, hey, that's not a saying that we know in America. Please explain it to me in more detail. So we all know that we all have these roles and responsibilities, and we all know that we have the body of Christ. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to read here about one body with many members. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12, says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would, make it any, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where, where, would the sense of, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body are, were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the, the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weak are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, we bestow the great honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, 
all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, this is a pretty simple concept for us to understand. Even the children amongst us are able to look at that picture and go, well, I can see the eyes, I can see the hands, I can see the feet. And we all know that each of those parts of our body are responsible for their own role. The hand cannot do what the feet do. You want to challenge me on that? Well, please go outside. If able to do that, great. I can't do a handstand, so I'm not even going to try and show you what it looks like. But your hands are not made the same way to take on the abuse that we have of walking, whether it be on the grass, whether it be on the paving, whether it be on the top. If we take away our eye, how are we able to see? If we take away our nose, how are we able to smell? So we understand this from a biology point of view. Very simple thing to understand. Well, it's very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the body of Christ is exactly the same thing. As I sit here and look amongst our members, I've had the privilege of spending some time with some of you on a personal note. We've spent some time aside from here, and I've got to know you a whole lot better. Mr. Joe is not here this morning, but a couple of weeks ago, I, got, I had the privilege of driving about two hours with him. And if I'm honest, in the beginning, he said to me, well, can I pick you up and you drive with me? And at first I was like, okay, you know, I've never really spent that much forced time with Joe in person. Well, from our relationship, not just as uh, brothers in Christ, but as friends, it was the best thing that Joe and I could ever have done for each other. At least from my point of view. He may beg to differ. But we spent two hours just chatting about life, understanding where he comes from, understanding where I come from. I got to hear where him and Sandy met and how that relationship developed. And it was such a great experience for him and I to share in those memories and those moments together. Here on the first day of the week, I am always encouraged when I have Luke and Simon walk up to me during the break and saying, hey, have you got the emblems for the Lord's Supper? Can I get them for you? Secret is sometimes I take one from each of them and I go and return the extras at the end. Why? Because it is such an encouragement to see the young men being involved. Likewise this morning, Cole walked up to me with Drew right on his heels. Hey, Mr. Richard, are you good for the sermon today? Yes, sir, I am. It is those little acts of worship that we have that build us up to be this body of Christ. We all have these responsibilities to play. I know that at the moment, Lindy is teaching some of the, the children's class, and I take my hat off to the ladies that do that. You're not going to catch me teaching those little three, four, five-year-olds anytime soon. Why? It's not in my wheelhouse. I struggle to be entertained for five minutes. How am I going to entertain and teach a group of children for 45 minutes? We all have these roles and responsibilities within the body of Christ to do. Some of us are great at speaking, standing up in front, giving a lesson. Some of the men are not comfortable to do this, but I'll tell you what. Let them say a prayer, they will blow their socks off, blow my socks off, right out of the water. I like to think that I can say a prayer, a public prayer, but there are men here that do a far finer job of it than what I do. We are privileged in this congregation to range from, I don't know who the youngest is in the congregation in terms of the children. We've got a couple of babies that are about to be born, but all the way, and I'm not going to point out who I think may be the oldest in this congregation, but we have this array of wealth of wisdom and knowledge. It has been a blessing for myself and Lindy to be here, to be able to meet all these different types uh, or different ages of people. I love chatting with Miss Norma after church. Why? She's just a wise lady with years of wisdom. She likes to, to teach and to share that wisdom with others. We all have these roles and responsibilities within the church. Now I ask the question, are you standing up to those roles and responsibilities? Are you standing up and stepping up to the plate 
to do those things. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, this is one of those things I was talking about where I said that because I'm from South Africa, there may be some sayings here that are a little bit different that may or may not get used in South Africa. And in South Africa, we have a saying that, oh, you just stir in the pot. Now, what that means is that you're just looking to create a little bit of trouble. I've been accused of that multiple times. I'm sure that before I die, I'm going to be accused of it many, many more times. In my professional career, I kind of became known for stirring the pot. I was employed in establishments to come in, evaluate how things were being done, and then question why. Well, why are we doing it that way? What about this? What about that? What about that? And it's always easy for somebody from an outsider to come in and to see the gaping holes that we sometimes don't get to see when you're so dug in and in the trenches. So I hope that that just stirring the pot there makes sense um, for you. But I want to reference Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The author of Hebrews here is not talking about stirring up the pot in a bad way. The author of Hebrews here is talking about stirring, one up, stirring up one another to love and good works. Now I'm sure if we were in a Bible study and I was able to ask a question and I was able to get some answers going. I'd pose the question and go, well, who's ever gone camping before? Who's ever built a fire before? Who's ever taken a rod or a stick or something and pushed it into those coals and see the fire come up? That's stoking the fire. Kind of the same idea of the stirring of the pot. And when I read Hebrews and I look at these things and I go, stir up one another, not for bad things, but to love and good works. How do I do that? How do I walk, walk up to any one of you and stoke that fire for love and good works? The author of Hebrews carries on says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Now, I have thought about this meeting together for a long time. I've gone back and had a look at it and thought, well, what is this actually talking about? Is this talking about meeting together on the first day of the week in the assembly, in this select time that we have? Or is this about meeting together? Now, as I mentioned earlier, I've had, I had the great opportunity of spending time with Joe just a couple of weeks ago. It was really, really great that even the next time I saw him on Sunday, the conversation was different. It wasn't just a case of, hey, how are you doing? Good. Okay, great. Hey, how are you doing? You know you that project you were busy with. Well, how, how is that going? How often do we walk through the door and everybody says, well, how are you doing? You go, I'm fine. What does that mean? Most of the time when somebody says, I'm fine, they're actually not. Well, how do we know? Well, I go back to the point that was raised uh, in the lesson or the study that, that Tom did a couple of weeks ago, where unless we get to know the people, we won't truly know how they're feeling. I've been married to my wife for five years. We've known each other for five years and eight months and a couple of days as it is today. And I have learned that if I look at her and I say, hey, how are you doing? And she goes, I'm fine. I know she's not. I know that if I look at her and ask her a question, she goes, well, if that's what you want to do, let's do it. She gets a certain expression on her face. I know that's not what she wants to do. But I know that she's doing it just to help me, to be the supportive wife. I've made many, many foolish decisions in the last five years. She's never said to me, I told you so. But in all of those decisions, she says, well, have you considered this? Have you considered that? But if that's your decision, go ahead with it. I'll be here when it may not work out the way that you think it would. She's also been that person that says, well, Lindy, I want to try and do A, B, or C, but I just don't think it's going to work. And she'll go, well, why not? And we sit and talk about it, and she goes, well, if I'm going to have to be the guy that gives you a little bit of a kick in the behind, I'm going to do it because I can see that this could work. 
So not only does she support me in the wrong, maybe I shouldn't say in the wrong, but when she doesn't necessarily agree with the idea, but she also pushes me to exceed and to grow. Well, we can only do that because we've been living together for five years. How do I do that with you? How do I do that with each and every one of you if all that we ever do is see each other on a Sunday morning? Now, I'm not taking away at all the fact that Sunday mornings, Wednesday evenings are important. They absolutely are. There is a reason that God put things into place, and one of those being coming together on the first day of the week to break bread together. But do we think that's all that God wanted of us? When I read this now, and after thinking out of it for a long time and meditating on these words, the author of Hebrews is saying, not neglecting to meet together. That meet together is meeting together. Not just here, but outside of here. Do we do enough of that? We certainly have pockets of individuals that do spend a lot of time together. And I love them for it. There are individuals that have made the effort to embrace Lindy and I as outsiders. We rocked up here, not having told anybody that, hey, we're the two South Africans and we're just going to rock up at North Texan Church of Christ June 25th, whatever it was, a year ago. And we have been made to feel like family. That's great. But I don't know the struggles that Miss Norma faces on a day to day basis. I don't know the wins that Stephen's making with his Bible studies. I've had the privilege of spending a little bit of time with Bill Holt and Jimmy Richardson out on his property after he had his surgery. It was great. I'll admit, if I don't know people in the beginning, it's very hard for me to be sociable. But I put myself out there and said, let's do it. Why? Because it's not just good for me, but it's good for the church. Now when I see Mr. Jimmy walk in, I'm able to greet him knowing that we've spent some time together. If I hadn't have done that, well, it would have just been a case of, who's that old man walking in there again? Do we spend enough time together outside of this workplace? Do we spend enough time encouraging one another? Do we spend enough time edifying and uplifting one another? Now, brethren, I am not for a moment saying that we all need to live in each other's back pockets. That's not what I'm saying at all. We are very privileged here. I come from a congregation. I grew up in the church where the only people my age were my brother and my sister. Well, <laughs> I saw them every day of the week. Twice on Sunday, as the saying goes. It was great to be able to have family within the church. But it was sorely lacking that I didn't have friends to socialize with outside of the meeting place. One of the things that Lindy and I spoke about before we decided to move to America was, well, where do we want to move? We know that we want to leave South Africa for a myriad of reasons. And where do we want to end up? We looked at Australia. We looked at the UK. We looked at New Zealand. We looked at America. You want to know why America came out on tops? Because we knew that the church had a big footing in South Africa, uh, in America. We knew that we could come here and just about pick anywhere in the United States and be able to find a church to meet with. Just so happens, we ended up in Chattanooga. Just so happens, we ended up here. Just so happens, we've made some really, really good friends since we've been here. We've had people reach out to us when we haven't been here for a Bible study because we've been out of town. Hey, just wanted to check in. How are things going? That is such a different world that we are used to coming from South Africa. When we left South Africa, there were probably, on a good day, 30 members. The youngest being my nephew, who was just a year old. The oldest being my grandmother at 85 years old. With such a big, vast array of age of number, you can kind of do the sums on how diversified the number were and how few friends we had, like what we have here. 
when I stand here and look, I can already start to see groups of people that are the same age that could be socializing, that could be friends outside of this meeting place. The other night I had a phone call from an individual here. Hey, what are you guys doing tomorrow? Nothing. You want to come over and play some cards? Sure. Lindy and I looked at each other and said, well, we haven't played cards in a long time. We went and had a great night with this couple. And we learned more about them playing cards than what we learned sitting here on a Sunday morning with them. Again, I am not taking away anything that we do here on a Sunday morning. It is great to be here every single Sunday. When we travel, we miss being here. Why? Because this is home. We know the people. We know the faces. We know the routines. We know how things happen. Do we spend enough time meeting together? Or do we fall into that trap of where the author of Hebrews says, as is the habit of some who are neglecting to meet together? How do we encourage one another if we're not interacting with each other? How do we do so to stir up love and good works if we are not spending time together? How do we build a community without the interaction of everyone? Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Now, I don't believe that anybody here is a metal worker, an ironsmith. But I believe that we understand the principles around it. But I believe that we also understand the saying, oh, you are the company that you keep. I've met some people here in the U.S. that are not Christians. Great individuals, but they're not Christian. But we have a common uh, love of being uh, behind the steering wheel of a motorized vehicle, bouncing up rocks and tearing things up and having a blast doing it. But Lindy said to me, she's like, you act different when you're around them. And I go, why? She goes, you just do. And when I sit back and reflect on that, I go, well, that's because of the type of people that they are. Now, again, I am not saying do not have friends that are not Christians. Otherwise, how would we be able to teach them? How would we be able to learn? Just so happens last night I posted, I was busy at the, at the kitchen table last night going over my lesson for this morning. And I took a photo of it and I posted it up on social media and I said, I'm really looking forward to being able to preach at church this morning. Well, I had a couple of people reach out and go, hey, can we watch that live stream? Hey, can we get a recording of that? I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Well, is that some influence that I can have on people that right now are not focused on being godly? Absolutely. But how am I to become a better Christian if I don't spend time with Christians? In a workplace, in a secular place, I always employed people that were smarter than me. I didn't want to be the smartest guy in the room. Why? Because then it was a constantly me teaching them how to do a job instead of me getting their expert input on how to achieve a goal. And when I had that mind shift change, because believe me, I never started out like that. When I got into management positions, I was on a bit of a power trip, if I have to say so. Why? It was a learning curve. I wanted to make sure that I had all the answers. I wanted to make sure that I could forge the path through and that all these people would follow me. Well, that's changed. I want to be able to guide. I want to be able to know where we need to end up. That doesn't mean I need to know how to get there. That doesn't mean I need to be the smartest man in the room. Well, when I put myself around people that know how to do these things, I learn from them. And in that way, the iron sharpens iron. Well, as Christians, how do we expect to be pleasing to God? How do we expect to be Christians? How do we expect to be biblical examples when all we are are Sunday-going Christians? What do I mean by that? We go to church on a Sunday. We go to Bible study on a Wednesday. 
And the rest of the time our Bible stays closed and we associate with people that want nothing to do with God. How do, we, how do we expect to be a Christian? How do we expect to be the best example that we can be? How do we expect, if I go back and Jeremy showed me how to use the back button, how do I expect to be able to stir up one another in love and good works if I'm not spending more time with you? Safe was here on, on Wednesday, and before he presented his lesson to us, I was standing at the back and I was chatting with him and I said, so tell me a little bit about what you're going to be preaching on tonight. And he said, sowing support was the topic given to me, but Byron said I could kind of go in any direction with it, so I'm going with fellowship. And I looked at him and I said, that's great. I said, on Sunday I'm preaching and we're going to be talking about fellowship as well. And he said to me, well, I hope that I don't steal any of your lines. And I said to him, absolutely not. I said, there is enough material in the scriptures that we can study fellowship for a year and still not run out of things to, to study about. And in the conversation that, that him and I were having, these talks sort of started coming out between him and I, just in terms of, well, are we spending time with Christians? Are we spending time ironing, uh, iron sharpens iron? He is a very interesting man to speak to. He has got some, some views of the world. But we have a common goal. And that's to be pleasing to God. At the end of the evening, we exchanged numbers. We said we're going to get together in the new and continue some of the discussions that we had. Well, I don't see him sitting here on this first day of the week. Well, that's because he's a member of another congregation. But you know what the beauty of it is? is that we're all one family. So often, when we meet new people, we may turn around and say, well, I don't have anything in common with them. What am I going to talk about? Well, I can give you two things that you will have in common with him immediately. One, you are a human being. And because of that, you have something in common. Two, you have a, lo a love for your Lord, and that gives you something else to have in common. When I go and have lunch, coffee, whatever it's going to be with him in the new year, there may be moments of odd silence. There may be. There may not be. Why? Because apart from him speaking here on Wednesday, I don't, I don't know him. I know his wife was here. I don't know how many children they have. I learned some of his background just because of the discussion that, uh, that we had after the lesson. Um, and it was great. So now I'm going to bring that back home. There are faces here that I've not had the privilege of spending more time with other than on a Sunday morning, sometimes the Wednesday evening. And sometimes I sit and think to myself and I go, well, that's okay. Why? Well, because that individual is 20 years older than me. What are we going to talk about? But yet on the other hand, there's some children running around here that I often sit and talk with them on a Sunday. They look at me and go, Mr. Richard, you're old. I'm only 30, 35, 36, I can't even remember. But when they look at me, they think that you're old, but I can have a conversation with them. Well, if I can have a conversation with them, why can't I have a conversation with somebody older than me? When I look around here, there are so many faces that we can get to interact with. We are blessed, brethren. To be in a congregation where we have people that we can socialize with outside of Sunday and Wednesday. We are blessed to be able to have a potluck and say, well, come on over, friends. Why? We're going to watch this thing called football. I still don't understand. I don't know that I'm ever going to understand it. But let's watch the football game together. It's Alabama versus Tennessee. Okay, well, who am I supporting? I don't know. But we're there having fellowship with one another. We are meeting together. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is probably one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, but certainly verses 13 and 14 of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 are my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this 
this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The end of the matter, all has been heard. In other words, it is the end, the be all. Fear God and keep his commandments. I've spoken about this word fear before with God. This is not a fear of somebody that's going to beat you up. This is not a fear that Alabama might face when they run onto the field against Tennessee. This is a fear of respect. I fear my father in Cape Town. He's never laid a hand on me out of an abusive relationship. I got my fair share of spanks, hidings, whatever you call them here in America when I was growing up. The family joke is I got my last one just before my 21st birthday. I fear my father out of respect for who he is. He's taught me. He's nurtured me. He's looked after me. Has God the Father in heaven done that for us? He's given us the scriptures to learn from, to re be rebuked from, to be encouraged from, to have a family from, to love from. Do we fear God? And do we keep his commandments? If the answer to that is yes, well, each of us need to ask ourselves, well, what am I doing to make sure that I'm meeting with my fellow brethren? What am I doing to make sure that we grow this community in Christ? What am I doing to make sure that I'm stirring up each and every one of you in love and good works? Now, we have a couple of visitors here today. It counts for you as well. Why? Because as I mentioned, just because we're meeting at this congregation here does not mean that we're of a different family. We're all of the family of the Lord. And with that, we can stir up one another to good works and to love. As we go through this week, I want you to think about these things. And as I mentioned at the beginning of, of the lesson, I'm not one for New Year's resolutions. I think it's one of those things that We've made such a big thing about it that it's actually lost the effort of what it was all about. But I am one for goal setting. I am one for looking back and going, well, what have we done? What do we want to repeat? What do we want to improve on? And what don't we want to do at all? I encourage you to do that, not just in your individual life when it comes to your spiritual studies and your spiritual growth, but also about the congregation here. We are blessed, brethren. We have a great group of people here. I don't know how to support you if I don't know you. I don't know how to support you if all that our engagement is is as you walk through the back door on a Sunday morning, I go, hey, how are you? Oh, good. Okay, great. The only way we're going to do that is to get to know each other. In my conversations with Jeremy leading up to this week, I said to him, well, this is what I'm going to be preaching. And he said, well, this is great. Because he kind of gave me a little bit of insight into what our theme is going to be for 2024. And I don't want to give it away, but I want you to think on these things. Because without these things, this number here will dwindle. Without having fellowship with one another, without building community, we will struggle. I am not taking away the fact that all that we need elders. I agree, we need elders. But in my many years of being involved in the church and in the short 18 months that Lindy and I have been in the US, we have had the privilege of traveling and meeting with some other congregations. The congregations that have it together are the congregations that have community. We were in, so encouraged when we were in North Carolina a couple of months ago it was a Sunday evening, and their practice was, like ours, you meet on a Sunday morning, and that's your service time. And because we were visiting with my sister, who knew some people there, we were going to have a potluck in the afternoon. Well, the potluck started early on in the day. At half past ten that night, we were staying with the local preacher there. He got a phone call saying, can you get the baptistry ready? 
Sure, absolutely. Who's getting baptized? One of the boys there, he must have been 16, 17 years old. He was hanging out with some of the other Christian boys there. And they were in a drive through getting fast food takeaways. And he had a moment and said, I need to be baptized. Well, within the space of 30 minutes, we had set up the baptistry. The house was exploding with people. We baptized this young boy. There was celebration. There was camaraderie. There was community. Everybody from that congregation rocked up there to see that baptism happen. We had fellowship with one another. It was so encouraging. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. They don't have elders, but they have community. In our prayers for 2014, uh, 2024, in terms of what we want to achieve here, let's make sure that in addition to praying that we get elders, because again, I agree, once you have elders, things are different. But let's also pray about community that we have here. We don't need elders to have community. There is nothing stopping all of us from getting together. I have heard some of the stories of uh, the celebrations that used to happen at the Bowens property. I have not been privy to them. One of my goals for 2024 is we're going to have a celebration there. I don't know what it's going to be about. And whether it means that I need to bring one of my South African traditions across and invite every single one of you there, I'll make it happen. Why? Because I want to spend time with you. I want to make sure that we can grow up, that we can nurture, that I can stir you up in love and to good works. Remember, fear God and keep His commandments because that is our duty. In a moment, we're going to have uh, the invitation song. Now, me giving out an invitation is not something I've ever done before in this setting. So I'm going to do things a little bit different. In a moment, we're going to have the invitation song. I'm going to be standing at the back. If you have not decided yet to give your life to Jesus and you want to, I'll be at the back. Come and talk to me. We can make that happen. There's some haste. Because I'd much rather do it before we do the partaking of the Lord's Supper than after. Why? Because then I can invite you in as family. If there's something else that you need help with, I'll be at the back. Let's stand as we sing.